So like a lot of the talks today, this is actually a collaborative project with Simon Fitzpatrick, who's at John Carroll University. Um, and the paper has just been accepted in, in philosophy of science. So um, that's why I dropped it in the chat at the wrong opportunity. I'm sorry about that, but uh, it's there for you to, to actually read if you want to. Um, and so today I'm just I'm going to kind of briefly go over the, the main points here. Um, so starting with this idea of, of animal culture, um, this is something that, that has in the last 20 years in um, cognitive ethology and um, comparative cognition and cognitive ecology and biology and anthropology been um, one of the most exciting developments um, in, in these sciences. So culture or socially inherited patterns of behavior and information um, have been identified in a wide variety of non-human animals at this point. So you see on this slide here, this is from Andy Whiten's 2021 paper where he um, reviews some of this evidence and we see culture and everything from whale song and navigation routes to um, social learning in bumblebees and choices of fruit flies about where to lay their eggs based on where others are laying their eggs. But this whole idea of animal culture was first um, kind of came to be in the North American context and European context um, with this paper in uh, 1999 about chimpanzees, culture in chimpanzee communities, researchers who had different wild research sites across the continent of Africa were collaborating and looking to see if there are behaviors that are unique to their community of chimpanzees and not seen in other communities. And they found at that point more than 50 cultural behaviors. I think at this point, um, folks have identified at least informally um, over 300. So culture in this context, I already gave you a very brief um, definition, but I'm gonna put it up here on the slide. Um, we can understand culture in this context as socially transmitted patterns of behavior or, or information that are common to members of a group, but differ between subpopulations of the same species and are not ecologically or genetically based. So in the most inclusive sense of the term culture or animal culture, you just have socially transmitted patterns of behavior or shared socially learned information. Um, in the brackets are ways this definition has been modified slightly in order to try to, I, I think, set a higher bar for an animal to count as having culture, um, but it has certain unfortunate um, consequences, right? So when we say that these are behaviors that are common to members of a group, but, mem but differ between subpopulations, that, um, that doesn't permit certain sorts of possibilities like knowledge or behavioral spread through immigration. And when we um, say that a behavior has to um, not be genetically based, what we're doing is saying that we can't see um, gene culture coevolution or dual inheritance in non-human animals. Um, and when we say that culture can't be ecologically based, we're also going to lose a lot of potential behaviors that in a human context would be seen as, uh, as cultural behaviors that have to do with like the certain sort of materials that exist in this environment and um, not in another environment. So I'm bracketing those um, more specific uh, senses of culture because I think that they're, they're problematic. In particular, they're problematic, um, as I mentioned, when we consider that dual inheritance theory might be true, not just for um, human animals, but for non-human animals as well. So dual inheritance theory is this idea that like genetic variants, cultural variants may be passed down from one generation to the next and um, may increase or decrease or be neutral um, with respect to an organism's re reproductive fitness. So understanding the role of socially learned practices in the life ways of particular subpopulations of animals um, is going to be really important when we're looking at whether or not um, the animal has evolved some mechanisms or some predispositions to fit their particular ecological niche. And if they fit their, their ecological niche, 
additional learned behaviors might then change their ecological niche as well, right, might re result in niche construction that then creates new environmental pressures on subsequent generations. And so what you see in dual inheritance theory is this idea that genetic inheritance and cultural in inheritance are intertwined. And the most famous sorts of examples would be um, human herders evolving lactose tolerance, or uh, human crustacean foragers evolving a greater lung capacity to support free diving for extended periods of time, um, or human fire users cooking meat who evolve bigger brains. So there's been some debate about whether or not there's um, gene culture coevolution in non-human animals, um, but I think along with some other theorists, including Carl Van Schaik, who's argued um, that we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of animal culture because of the more stringent definition. I think that we have reason to uh, be optimistic it's going on there too. So taking these two, um, these two kind of pieces together, this idea that there's culture in non-human animals and that's very widespread among species, <coughs> not just in chimpanzees, but you know, maybe in invertebrates as well, alongside dual inheritance theory as a theory that may apply to evolution of non-human animals as well. Some theorists have argued that these um, have significant impacts for supporting our conservation goals. So um, among, you know, so most notably, I mean, among these folks is this article um, by Brakes and colleagues who've suggested that there are a number of different direct implications for conservation efforts um, that, that are aimed at populations that are at risk, um, vulnerable to extinction. And these would be things such as um, culturally viable variable foraging or migratory strategies um, of animals in different subpopulations would mean that the same species would have different abilities to weather environmental changes caused by things like climate change or habitat destruction. And so when we're looking at, for example, whether we need to build a road and is it going to go through this community of elephants or that community of elephants, are there cultural differences in these two communities that would make it um, uh, more likely that the community would survive um, one intervention versus the other? Also, understanding the role of social learning in behaviors such as crop rating in elephants or orangutans um, might help us to determine how to better mitigate these sorts of human wildlife um, a complex. And in reintroduction pop programs where you have um, animals who have been all right, taken into captivity because they've been perhaps orphaned or um, for other reasons. And training them and releasing them into communities um, is something that one needs to think very carefully about when it comes to, to culture. The example of Keiko the killer whale, um, who starred in those Free Willy movies, um, and people were like, oh, well, let's free Keiko. If we can free Ki Willy, we should free Keiko. And all of these attempts to, to free Keiko um, ended in failure after millions of dollars and years of effort and lots of, of stress on Keiko's part because Keiko didn't have the cultural knowledge um, that was needed to survive in these wild populations. All right, so th this is one implication, one conversation that people are having given animal culture um, and gene culture coevolution. And what Simon and I are doing in this paper is we're asking about another implication. And that is what, uh, what is the relevance of animal culture to captive animal welfare? Um, and so in this talk today, I'm gonna to briefly go over these five questions. What are the goals of animal welfare policy? What, what do we wanna achieve? Um, I think thinking about end goals and, and utopia, I've been forced here while well, I've been at LSE this term to think about uh, what are what is the utopian end goal of some of this work, which has been a, a real challenge for me because I don't know what it is, but I was thinking about that um, in Angie and Richard's talk as well. Um, so what are the goals? How can animal culture inform, the, inform these goals? Um, and what does current animal welfare policy get wrong about animal well-being? Um, 
And, oh, I'm not going to talk about this, this fifth one because I don't think we'll have time, uh, but then briefly turn to the question of should we conserve animal culture? So animal welfare policy goals um, to get started. And I think these are pretty clear and we can go through this pretty easily. Um, the consensus is to the effect that needless harm to animals should be avoided, right? Pretty much everyone agrees that, that that's the goal. Um, but what that means and how to unpack that isn't always as clear. So physical pain is often um, what's, what's um, cited here. It's the obvious harm. Um, but there are also other sorts of harms that could be created because of the existence of culture in animals. Culture creates another way in which cultural beings can be harmed. It can, can include involve cultural harms. So if we look at human societies, cultural harms are, are pretty easy to identify. Um, an example would be forbidding certain cultural practices like Sikh, forbidding Sikhs to wear ceremonial daggers in schools or uh, forbid people from wearing headscarves um, when they're getting their photos, um, photo ID taken. Other kinds of cultural harms that are discussed in the human context will include cultural appropriation, um, destruction of important cultural sites or mishandling important cultural objects. Um, and you know this is very clear um, from a Canadian context. The cultural harm that was that was done by residential schools in uh, in Canada, which tore apart families, ended intergenerational transfer of knowledge, um, and had this kind of transformative goal in mind of really stripping kids and families from their culture. This is a real cultural harm that exists. And I think it exists, I mean, obviously people suffered and there was a lot of pain, but it's a harm that is on top of the pain it caused in the individuals. Um, it's a cultural harm. And so what, what we wanna look at is how captivity can create a context for possible cultural harms to animals as well, and how we can try to protect against those cultural harms. Um, so in order to do that, um, I want to first make the point that captive animals have culture too, because sometimes it seems that folks think, oh yeah, so wild animals might have culture, but in captivity, animals uh, don't have culture. And then I'll look at these three ways, these three kind of prima facie ways that culture impacts well-being of captive animals. Um, and the first is that you need soci um, sociality of the right kind, you need opportunities to construct culture, and you need certain kinds of epistemic access. All right, so why think that captive animals have culture too? Well, if we look at um, many different models of what captivity looks like in, um, with non-human animals, we see that there are multi-species communities in all of these cases. Some of them are structured like the Vine Sanctuary in Vermont, which has very deliberately um, seen as a way of supporting animals to live out and flourish given their own um, species interests and individual interests, but without thinking that the animals need to be in a kind of species um, specific environment that, they, that you can share llamas and chickens and cows can all be living with humans as well. You have another kind of captive animal culture um, this is Lori Santos's monkey lab at Yale, which is the picture above it, where you have monkeys living with human caregivers who are attending to right, these research subjects' needs and engaging in the research with them. And then you have examples like the picture to the side, which, which uh, represents Anthony Keyes Resort, which is a dolphin ecotourism and research center in Honduras, where dolphins live in captivity in the sea um, and the net opens up and the door opens up and so sometimes they leave and, and but they always come back because that's where they're fed. Um, humans swim with them, but they have a certain amount of freedom to decide whether they interact with the humans or not because there's a lot, a big part of the enclosure that is not accessible to humans. It's too deep and too far away. Humans can't get there. Um, so we see these different sorts of examples of, of humans and non-human animals living together 
um, in community, which gives us a prima facie reason for thinking that there could be culture in these sorts of contexts. I think that the strongest uh, reason for thinking that captive animals have culture is that even though most of the pioneering work on animal culture was conducted with wild populations like the chimpanzees, um, and many of the important cognitive studies that really supported the interpretation of these wild observations were done in the lab and conducted with captive populations. Right, so you have here, right, one of the examples from the Andy Whiten paper, the um, Lars Chika's work on social learning and bumblebees. Um, below that, we have a, um, an image from Monfils and Aggie 2018 review article on social learning of food preferences in rats, right? So if rats smell um, cocoa on the breath of rats in there in a group, they'll eat cocoa food and um, avoid cinnamon flavored food or vice versa. Um, and then this third image is from Victoria Horner and all's um, chimpanzee diffusion experiment. You have a box that can be opened in two different ways. If one way is demonstrated to the alpha in the community and then the other members of the community can observe the alpha opening the box in one way, that behavior spreads to the rest of the community. So there's social learning that we see um, evidence in, in great evidence in captive populations. There's also evidence of social learning in farmyard animals such as cattle, pigs, sheep, and chicken. And as I said earlier, um, it's certainly premature to deny that group-specific cultural traditions uh, exist in these sorts of species, uh, in the lab species and in the, the farm animals and sanctuary animals. This is because if the recent history of animal culture research is any guide, it seems more likely that we are underestimating rather than overestimating the extent of cultural complexity beyond these high profile examples in primates and cetaceans, right? For the reason that the definition of culture often includes these three properties that I bracketed, um, making the bar much higher. So in this paper, Simon and I proceed on the assumption that while recognizing there's going to be significant variation in the nature and extent of cultural capacities across taxa, many species of captive animals, from those used in agriculture and in medical research to those found in zoos, are cultural species. So with that established, um, I'm gonna to turn to the three prima facie ways in which culture, um, culture would matter for captive animals. Um, and the first is a sociality. So it's certainly true that uh, welfare approaches to animals from uh, typical traditional approaches recognize that sociality is important. We certainly have known this since Harry Harlow's social isolation experiments with macaques made the need for social contact clear. Um, but the lens of culture shows us that the types of social relationships are also extremely important. So a need for social contact with a range of conspecifics who occupy different roles, things like different stages of life, different level of prestige or different um, degree of expertise is going to be really important for deciding who to learn from. Of course, mothers often serve as the first point of cultural contact, but in many species, same age peers are an, also an important source of cultural knowledge. Um, as is in the case of predator recognition in minnows or grass wearing in the ears by chimpanzees. In other cases, juveniles may acquire cultural knowledge from same sex adults other than a parent, as in the case of male chimpanzees learning to hunt monkeys or female African elephants learning how to signal sexual re receptivity in their first estrus. Um, it's also likely that some cultural species may have a psychological need to pass on cultural information to their offspring or peers. This need doesn't necessarily have to be conscious or explicit, right? If there's no metacognitive access um, that's required for this, for there to be this kind of felt need. Um, these can include opportunities to reproduce and raise their own offspring. And if these opportunities are not provided, then there's going to be a a loss that's of ethical significance. Um, and finally, we want to recognize that 
that these, you know, the sociality of the right sort may include um, contra specifics and not just con specifics. So for example, when you take the case of Happy the Elephant in the Bronx Zoo and say, we must move her because she has no elephant companions and you're not paying attention to the human companions that Happy might have and Happy's particular preference or lack thereof for other elephants, um, then you're not taking into account the sociality of the right kind and the kind of culture that might have come up in that particular context. All right, so the cultural nature of animals requires consideration of type and quality of social partners, um, not just sociality, but sociality of the right sorts. The second implication, initial implication, is that um, there's a need for culture if you're a cultural species. And if you have no culture in place, you need, an, you need the opportunity to construct a culture. So when it comes to questions about environmental enrichment, richness um, in the socio-cultural environment should be taken as um, a, a significant consideration in determining levels of animal welfare alongside richness in the physical environment. All right, so typically enrichment would be um, an activity that might be quite individualistic, like a puzzle box or some material for an individual to interact with. But from a cultural perspective, one would want to see um, materials where multiple individuals can engage in the same behavior at the same time, where they can be copying. Puzzle boxes should be placed such that social learning opportunities are available to other individuals in the group so that they can watch and see what's happening. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And this is a picture from the Peyton Zoo and Devon of orangutan wearing a, a, rice, a rice bag, which is a behavior that sometimes spreads in captive orangutan communities. All right, so the third um, kind of prima facie implication of, of uh, uh, culture on animal welfare is epistemic and the need to recognize the epistemic losses and welfare effects of changing community compositions as a result of standard practices such as regrouping, rehousing, moving individuals from one facility to another and so on. So for instance, removing older in individuals who have knowledge about rare or less frequent events such as death or seasonality or caregiver turnover might have significant effects on the overall functioning and welfare of the group leading um, leaving naive individuals to start over in an epistemic culture building project. Just as the lack of cultural knowledge on the part of reintroduced animals seem to have undermined efforts to restock endangered populations in the wild, in the case of captive animals, it seems important that newcomers are provided with opportunities to learn from other knowledgeable individuals. Um, so there's evidence that housing dairy calves and social groups increases weaning rate, weaning rates um, compared with individuals housed uh, individually because it facilitates their learning of grazing behavior. Um, and in another example, um, when you look at different integration events in groups of captive chimpanzees and how they are successful or not successful, immigrants who more quickly adopt the cultural practices of the group seem to be um, accepted by other group members more quickly than those who are reluctant to do things the way we do it around here. Um, so it would be desirable for caretakers to find ways to scaffold so social learning um, in immigration in order to facilitate better, better integration. <laughs> All right, so these are the, you know, kind of the, just three initial um, potential implications. Uh, and we suspect there are many more implications that we could be thinking about. But on top of that, um, one thing Simon and I worry about is that current animal welfare policy uh, ends up getting some things wrong about animal well being when they don't consider culture. So if we just look at, you know, what are the goals of, uh, again, the goals of animal welfare and some of the statements of the particular ways in which those goals are achieved, the World Organization for Animal Health's Terrestrial Animal Health Code 
states, an animal experiences good welfare if the animal is healthy, comfortable, well-nourished, safe, is not suffering from unpleasant states such as pain, fear, and distress, and is able to express behaviors that are important for its or their physical and mental health. Um, and we can see this quite clearly when we look at the UK Farm Animal Welfare Council's five freedoms, right? So an animal should have freedom from hunger and thirst. I think that that one is pretty clear. We can put a check. I don't think culture exactly uh, is involved there, though, of course, in the human case, um, sometimes we, we uh, fast. And so freedom from hunger and thirst would not always be um, a goal, uh, a cultural goal for humans. Not, not clear it's relevant though. The other four are relevant for non-human animals, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, disease, freedom to express normal behavior and freedom from fear and distress. So I'm gonna go through those four briefly. Um, so culture and discomfort, fear and distress. Um, sometimes discomfort, fear and distress is important in order to, um, to to manage your situation in a social group. So consider fighting in dominance fighting in rats or in chimpanzees. Um, fighting has direct harmful effects on the individuals who fight, but fighting is also a normal part of how many animal societies work and how interpersonal relations are managed. Um, we also looking at like different behaviors like pacing, hair pulling and rocking, these sort of stereotypies that are sometimes identified as indicating poor welfare, um, in fact, might be ways of managing the environmental stresses that individuals have found and trying to stop individuals from these self-soothing behaviors would be problematic um, as well as you know the way they're problematic when you try to get a school child to you know get out from under a table when that's what they need to do in order to to soothe themselves in that sort of environment. Um, the struggling to learn is another example of where you would find some discomfort or distress, um, but the discomfort and distress may actually be an important part of a learning process. Um, it's hard to learn some things. It takes some while. It takes a while. It can be really frustrating. Um, when a chimpanzee is learning to ant dip, they're going to get bit. And when they get bit, they're going to be brushing the ants off and they're going to be running around. Um, and so even when learning happens, uh, happens in a prolonged period of time that involves distress, um, is something that shouldn't be dismissed or certain shouldn't be something where the uh, caregivers intervene automatically just because there's uh, distress involved in the situation. Likewise, when we look at culture and pain, injury, and disease, we see that human cultural practices include behaviors um, that involve pain and risk of injury and disease from behaviors like tattooing our skin or piercing our body um, or open mouth kissing or hugging right, during a pandemic, right? These, are, these might be dangerous games for humans, um, but they're games that we're willing to, uh, that are very important to us. And we might not know the risks, but taking away these, uh, these behaviors would be uh, a cultural harm. So directly parallel, to human cultures, the cultural practices of particular groups of animals might not always support the flourishing of individuals on some measures. Several practices in captive populations um, appear to be cultural in origin, even though they're identified as abnormal. Um, so for example, eating feces or smearing feces are socially transmitted, it appears, and vary between different groups of captive chimpanzees and rhesus macaques, according to Hook. Um, and, and colleagues, um, 2002. Cannibalism in chickens also appears to be socially learned and clearly has direct negative effects on the injured chickens. Um, so managers need to understand the social aspect of these sorts of behaviors in order to control the spread of the behaviors if they think that they need to, um, but also to be mindful of the potential negative effects of some inter interventions such as isolating groups of chickens from each other. Um, 
Finally, uh, along these lines, recognizing an abnormal behavior is cultural might also change its, our understanding of its relevance to welfare. So Lydia Hopper and colleagues discussed the case um, of feces eating in chimpanzees and argue that while this is typically taken to be indicative of negative welfare, it need not necessarily reflect any deficit in the health and psychological well being of the individuals who do it, but it could just be the way this particular group of chimpanzees does things. Um, potential cultural behaviors involve health, health risks are also seen in wild populations, such as corpse carrying by chimpanzee mothers after their infants have died, or capuchin um, hair pulling and finger and eye socket game, which is pictured here, um, was identified by the anthropologist Susan Perry. So for captive populations, similar risky activities may have to be reviewed in the context of their potential cultural importance. And we see, you know, one very, very stark example of um, abnormal, unnatural behavior in orangutans at Camp Leakey. So the, the Camp Leaky orangutans socially learned a number of human behaviors. They had access to human materials, including saws, soap, brushes, paddles, uh, canoes, and so on. Um, and they've adopted these sorts of behaviors, thus creating a different kind of cultural environment for these um, liminal animals living between the wild and uh, in the human context. So, what is welfare beyond the five freedoms? Um, what else do we need? I think, uh, Simon and I think one thing we need was clearly identified by Susanna Monceau and her colleagues in their 2018 paper, that the five freedoms misses harms that relate to thwarting cultural capacities. Um, there there's the relevance of culture uh, to welfare trans transcends the effective states of animals. Um, they, so Monso and colleagues discuss the case of social animals who have the capacity for empathy and sympathy and are inclined by those, those capacities to aid group mates in distress. So like a sow um, or um, a cow may feel sympathy for their offspring um, when they're, say, being castrated without anesthetic or when they're being taken away um, um, in order to, for the mom to produce the milk. Um, so, and then they're being prevented from comforting. So they're feeling distress when their offspring's taken away, and they um, are also then prevented from exercising their capacity for care um, when the animal, when their offspring's taken away for them. So similarly, the thwarting of cultural capacities, we think, constitutes a kind of harm that transcends any effective states that may go along with that thwarting. If cultural animals are deprived of opportunities to engage in social learning or to take part in cultural practices or build a culture where none exists, um, something of value directly relevant to assessing their welfare has been lost, even if this loss isn't something that's felt by the animal themselves. Um, and there's different ways we were thinking about characterizing this harm. Um, which might in include things like a loss of meaning to the lives of animals or a loss to their agency or their autonomy. Um, so yeah, we wanna broaden the concept of welfare beyond basic um, physical health and functioning and, uh, and uh, the effective states. Another concern um, of welfare beyond the five freedoms is that when we're looking at the possibility of creating new um, captive situations, like this proposal to create an octopus farm um, to breed octopuses for people to eat, um, what we're suggesting, uh, suggesting that is gonna happen is a new uh, culture is gonna be created. Octopuses haven't yet been identified as a cultural species, but again, given this tip of the iceberg phenomenon and the knowledge that octopuses engage in social learning and that they live in some contexts in octopolis and social groups, um, we're going to, we suspect we're going to see um, the creation of a culture and it's a culture that's going to be a quite problematic culture given how the octopuses would have to be housed with 
almost no um, enrichment opportunities. And given how um, octopuses are cannibals and they fight each other and it's just, it's gonna be horrible. Um, so if we're thinking about creating a new captive situation, we need to think about it in terms, not just of their, um, their um, effective states, but as well in terms of the kind of culture we'd be creating. All right, so I just wanna to turn to kind of this, two more questions and then I'll stop for discussion. Um, one question is whether we should conserve animal cultures, right? So I've already discussed about some cultures like the octopus culture, if we created it, it might be terrible. Um, the chicken uh, cannibalism culture might be a culture that mm, we don't really want to encourage. And we certainly make judgments about the normative st status of human cultures and involve, get involved in interventions of, of going into a culture and trying to change cultural behavior from child marriage um, or genital cutting or open defecation and things like this. So it's not to say that every kind of culture is worthy of being conserved. But the question is rather, should animal cultures be, um, be conserved in, uh, in a sense, is, is culture itself something that is worthy of preserving as opposed to preserving any one particular culture? Um, and how Whitehead has argued that if biodiversity in animal life is valuable and should be conserved, and if culture and, culture and biology are inexorably intertwined, as gene culture coevolution would have it, then culture and animal life is valuable and should be conserved too. Um, so this is certainly the idea is that if we assume, if we take as a given premise that biodiversity is valuable, we're then forced into saying that culture is valuable as well. Um, because you literally cannot preserve one without the other, right? It's like when you're preserving a rug, you're preserving the weft and the weave alike. Um, so that's one implication and one way of getting to a positive answer that we should be preserving, um, conserving animal culture. And this should be put on the animal conservation um, agenda next to biodiversity. Mm. But also another reason, it's a common intuition that cultural practices have normative status for humans, of course. Um, so the UNESCO Cultural Declaration on Cultural Diversity states that cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. And there's no principled reason to only extend the value of cultural diversity to humans now that we know that other species are cultural too. Um, this the statement was made right at the time when culture and animals was, was just emerging as a topic of conversation in the West. And I keep stressing the West because Japanese primatologists identified it 50 years earlier. So, um, but the point is that having a culture is part of being a human. To imagine a human being without any culture is not to imagine a human. Likewise, having a culture is part of being a member of many species from bees to ch chimpanzees and by valuing animals' capacity to have culture, right, we're not approving of all the contents of their culture, rather we're making this deeper claim, namely that a cultural being requires culture for them to be themselves, and that there's something else if they're merely living the biological, they're merely the living biological material devoid of a cultural context. And this is uh, an additional reason why these de-extinction projects of like bringing back the woolly mammoth is so horrific because the proposal isn't to bring back a woolly mammoth, right? Because a woolly mammoth is not just a biological material, it's not a biolog living biological material, but was an animal that had um, a social context that it lived in and there would be no social context for it to live in. It would be, um, be a monster. It would be a monster like Frankenstein's monster, a lonely, a biological um, monster. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, and then in ending, I just want to make a, we wanna make a comment about culture and captivity and reasons why we, we need to value captive natives. 
Um, culture in a captive context, we think can be valuable and meaningful for animals. And captive cultures shouldn't be dismissed offhand as inferior to wild cultures. Captivity can change a group of animals culturally in such a significant way that they cannot be reintegrated into wild populations. We're at a point in animal captivity that there have been generations of great apes, cetaceans, and other species born into captivity. These captive natives should be provided with the opportunities to create their own cultures that allow them to thrive and that partially constitute who they are. The recognition of the relevance of culture to animal welfare should inform how we should think about and seek to improve the welfare of captive animals. And I'm done. Thank you so much.